Hey friends, I just want to invite you to consider joining the Theology Nara Patreon community. This is a group of followers who believe in the ministry and work of Theology Nara and want to support it financially. And honestly, I've been so impacted by the people who have chosen to support this podcast. Um, every month they send in a bunch of questions. A lot of them are really personal and I get to spend time responding to them in a private podcast. And we, you know, we'll message each other throughout the month and post responses to each other's questions. Um, I'm actually going to start something new this fall, a monthly live Zoom chat with some of the members. And I'm super looking forward to actually seeing more of their faces every month. And there's other perks to come up. Like, you know, they all get free uh, a free virtual pass to the Theology Nara Exiles in Babylon conference every year. But honestly, I don't want to make it sound transactional. Every single Patreon member that I've talked to says the same thing. We like all the perks. Uh, we're thankful for them, but we're just more thankful to support the ministry of theology in the raw, and we're glad to do so. So if this is you, if you've been impacted by Theology in Raw, you can join the Theology in Raw community for a minimum of five bucks a month by going to patreon.com forward slash Theology in Raw. That's patreon.com forward slash Theology in Raw. Um, the link is in the show notes. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Dr. Warren Carter. Uh, Dr. Carter is the LaDonna Kramer uh, Meanders Professor of New Testament at Phillips Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before that, he was a professor at Bright Divinity School, and he, let's see, is originally from um, New Zealand. He did his PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary, and uh, Warren is one of the most, uh, well, the, one of the leading scholars on um, imperial critical readings of the New Testament. We're going to unpack what that means, but basically, reading the New Testament not with the, well with the Roman Empire, not as background to the New Testament message, but as foreground. And um, I just had a fascinating conversation with um, with Warren. I've, I've read several of his works and always always learn a ton uh, from his writings. Um, and you'll he he he's one of those scholars that just like unlocks things in the New Testament that maybe you didn't see before. So we talk a lot about um, different passages in the New Testament and, and and then make some modern day application of, you know, when we talk about um, critiques, uh, subtle, sometimes subversive critiques of the Roman Empire in the New Testament, does that apply to how we should position ourselves today as Christians living um, in the American Empire for those of us who are living under that uh, power. So please welcome to the show for the first time, um, the one and only Warren Carter. Warren, I'm so excited about this conversation. Um, I've been reading your stuff for a long time, and uh, I, I wanted to have you on because you are one of one of the kind of experts on what it means to read the Bible um, against the backdrop of the empire. You've done a lot of work on Matthew and, and other New Testament letters in particular, can, can you, can we start, or first of all, this is, tell us, who are you? Uh, where'd you come from? How'd you get into academia? And, and then we'll jump into anti-imperial readings. Okay. Well, thanks, Preston. Good to be here. Um, I look forward to, to our conversation. Um, I am by um, origin a, um, a Kiwi, a New Zealander, Aotearoa, um, where I grew up. Um, of course, I grew up in a colony of the British Empire, which is not irrelevant to my interests in reading, particularly the New Testament. Um, and so I lived in uh, I lived in New Zealand way down under for um, some 30 or so years, came to this country, did my PhD at Princeton. Um, and then I have taught um, New Testament in Kansas City and then at um, Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, um, where I was respond where I was deeply involved in the PhD program. And in the last couple of years, I've been here at Phillips Seminary in Tulsa in Oklahoma. Okay, okay, good. Um, so when I when I hear a biblical scholar from um, New Zealand, I always think of Doug Campbell. He was kind of the first uh, major scholar from New Zealand that I um, got to know. Are you guys friends, or do you know each other? Or, or no, I don't know, know him. Um, I do know Paul Trebilco. Oh yeah, who who also does um, does New Testament stuff, and I know a few other folks as well. But no, yeah. I've never met Doug. Okay, how, how, so um, you've written a lot of books. Is your main uh, Area Matthew, that was always my guess. As you seem to be always, do, do, you've done a lot of work on Matthew. Did you do a dissertation on Matthew? Or? 
Yeah, I start. I, I started in Matthew, and I did my dissertation in Matthew. Um, um, I did a study of Matthew 19 and 20, which is the the um, the, the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, hmm. um, with a, a, a relevant teaching along the way. And I argued that what held those two chapters together was an understanding of households hmm. and alternative household structures. And actually, deep in the bowels of that thing was actually some recognition that empire might be relevant to all of this. But I, I really had no clue at the time that uh, I truly wrote more more accurately than I knew and realized. Interesting. Um, so then subsequently, um, as I thought some more about that gospel and more about the contexts from which it emerged and which it addressed, the whole imperial piece came much more to the fore. Okay. And so I set about exploring um, the gospel, Matthew's gospel, as a text that negotiates empire um, and tries to both understand empire and also to think about how Jesus' followers ought to live in that context. So that's where I sort of cut my teeth. Nobody else was thinking about Matthew in those terms um, at that time. Um, the main incentive for that in terms of scholarly terms was coming actually out of work on the historical Jesus uh, and also work, um, particularly by somebody like Dick Horsley, coming out of work on Paul. Um, but nobody was really doing anything on Matthew and, and those sorts of terms. So that was that was kind of fun and pioneering and a little bit frustrating because other people just wanted to talk about synagogues and individual sin and all those sorts of things. Yeah. I wanted to talk about imperial structures and visions and yeah. personnel and practices, et cetera, et cetera. And so from there, um, I have splashed out. I've done quite a bit on Revelation, okay. which I think is an obvious connection. I've also written a commentary on Mark, um, doing a similar sort of exercise with Mark's gospel. And then I've dabbled in various other bits and pieces okay. in, the, in the New Testament along the way. And particularly as the work has gone on, thinking more and more about the methods Know what sort of questions we're asking and how we're trying to answer them, um, and sort of recognizing the eclectic pieces um, that that come together, which is branched into things like masculinity studies. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're borrowed from post-colonial work, um, but these were things that uh, weren't on the agenda in the in the original work. So it's been an evolving mm -hmm. journey over the last. 25 or so years, which right. has kind of been fun, not just doing the same old stuff, yeah. but but yeah. seeing more and more uh, implications and developments from it. Can you give, let's give us, let's back up and give us a, just a kind of a, a 101 overview of what is it, uh, what are we even talking about here? What does it mean to read the Bible right. uh, through an anti imperial lens? Because you said this is kind of a newer study. It's like, wait a minute, we've been reading the Bible for 2,000 years. Like, wh what is this new right. angle and what does it look like? Right. Well, we have to locate it in, in ways of understanding and reading, especially the New Testament, over the last couple of hundred years. Um, occasionally, a few people have dabbled in areas of New Testament in the Roman Empire. We have the very famous um, scholar, um, uh, Rudolf Deisman, mm -hmm. um, from early in the 20th century, who sort of did some pioneering work. But generally, New Testament scholars have been interested in two other matters in terms of approaches. One, the New Testament and early Judaism, as though early Judaism is some sort of isolated island. Um, and it hasn't occurred to many folks doing that work that Judaism in the first century was occupied territory and lived under the domination of the Roman Empire. Um, and it was in that context in which Jewish folks did their work and their thinking uh, in the first century. Uh, and the second focus for me has been very individualized and spiritualized understandings of reading the New Testament, you know, me and my soul and me and my destiny and all those sorts of very individualized, um, privatized, spiritualized sort of concerns that even though we've given a nod to historical contexts, um, often what has dominated has been um, an understanding of, in individualized terms in those contexts. Mm -hmm. So um, to, to think about the Roman Empire and what we might call um, imperial critical readings or empire studies, 
um, and using critical in the sense not of being not of an attack but of discerning you know hmm. so you know a film critic okay. doesn't necessarily have to attack a film a film critic can at- and interpret and engage and um, um, evaluate a film hmm. for example and so that's how I understand the word critical, um, as an evaluation, as an, as an engaging. Um, what, what this work seeks to do uh, initially is to understand that the Roman Empire is not the background, but the foreground mm. for the early Jesus movement and the early texts. Um, you know, we have had a little bit of work on the background of the Roman Empire, but I think the image is totally wrong. Um, you know, it's like a it's like a stage set, right, where you have the backdrop, um, which is in these terms the Roman Empire, and the Christians are out front in the center of the stage doing the most important stuff, and that's about as historically wrong as we can get it. Um, you know, the early the early Jesus movement was was marginal, it was minority, it was hardly a blip on the screen in the first century. It wasn't center stage for anything. Um, but center stage was the Roman Empire um, for the early Jesus movement. Um, you got out of bed and you stubbed your toe on the empire. I mean, you didn't have any say in the matter. I mean, empire was daily life. Um, and so that's where that's where Jesus folks lived. And, of course, they lived as followers of one who was crucified by the empire. Um, Jerusalem leaders could not put someone to death. Pilate had to put Jesus to death. And there's a whole bunch of interactions going on there. Um, so this this approach, first of all, takes this context of Roman power very seriously and seeks to understand it. You know, how how did the Romans do empire? Um, you know, what was the societal vision? What were the societal practices? What were the societal structures? Who were the societal personnel doing this thing? that we know as as empire. Um, someone has said that, you know, we've been doing empire the same way for a couple of thousand years. Um, and there's a class somewhere that exists called Empire 101, and the syllabus has hardly changed <laughs> in a couple of thousand years. Um, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, the Roman Empire was a domination system. It was an exploitation system. It was in the hands of a very small group of ruling elites, Mm -hmm. both in Rome and in provincial centers. And that was one of the ways that Rome ruled, by making alliances with leading citizens in provincial centers, getting them on board, um, (coughs) and therefore they, they exercised their power. It was about control of land. It was about control of military resources. So it was a legionary um, empire. Um, It was economically exploitative through land and taxes and resources. Um, It was was an empire that benefited elites at the expense of non-elites. All the mapping of the Roman Empire suggests a huge percentage, and we can argue about where to put it, but 70, 80 percent, something like that. Of folks in the empire lived in varying degrees of poverty um, in in this in this world. Um, some on a seasonal basis, some permanently, um, with no no margin for error and no safety net. Um, and this was a system that was that had divine sponsorship. Um, as far as these these stakeholders are concerned, the empire is sanctioned by the gods. Mm-hmm. Rome is chosen by the gods to be the agent of the gods in ruling, controlling, dominating the, the known world. Um, one of the basic sort of texts of that understanding is Virgil's um, book, the Aeneid, or the the 12 books of the Aeneid. And in book one, we have Jupiter declaring that he has given to Rome empire without end. This is what he has given to Rome to exercise. So it's divinely sanctioned. And if you are smart and you want divine blessing, then, of course, you're going to submit to it. If you don't want to submit, then we just roll out the legions and take care of you that way. Um, so it's, it's this sort of dominating force. Um, and one of the things that New Testament scholars have not taken seriously is that this empire is daily life. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so the New Testament texts, um, when there has been any attention to this question at all, has focused on these so-called well-known chapters, you know, Romans 13, Revelation 13, 1 Peter, etc. And then the rest of the time have read the New Testament as though the empire doesn't exist. Okay. As though the empire's gone away. Okay. Well, it didn't go away. Um, you know, Jesus is crucified by the empire. Um, the fact that there are so many healing stories in the Gospels is a reflection of the damage that these imperial structures do to people's health. Um, empire should come with a warning. It's bad for your health um, because the resources are siphoned off by elites um, at the expense of non-elites. It's a very stressful world for, for non-elites. Now, we have some classical scholars working on stress in the, in the Roman Empire and the cost of it in terms of health and all these sorts of things. Can I, real um, quick, on that note, because that, that's that's fascinating. Are you suggesting that when Jesus heals people, that that, it, that has empire in not just the background, but in the foreground? Like he's that, yeah. that, is, that is making a statement against the structures of empire when he heals because uh, most 99 percent of people listening probably have only read those stories as you know the the coming of the the dawn of the new age the spirit of god is now you know running around healing people right. can you expand on that a little bit because that's that's yeah 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 um what i think is happening is that we have imperial claims that the empire has healed a sick world this is part of the imperial propaganda of course, it makes no sense because there are lots and lots of sick folks. Yeah. So um, what I think is happening are several things that when Jesus heals folks, partly it is a repairing of the imperial damage that the imperial systems cause to people. You know, we know what poverty does to people in the 21st century. We, we know the ill effects of poverty in our own world. And it was no different in the first century, except it was larger. In the, in the first century, um, structures that remove adequate resources from people that put people under stress cause people to be sick. Um, so when Jesus, first of all, I think that is an act of repairing this damage hmm. that the empire does. It's a way of rolling it back. It's a way of, of countering that damage. Hmm. But secondly, I think it's also an act of anticipation um, Matthew 11, for example, you know, when, when the, the followers of John the Baptist come to Jesus, and I think this is quite a witty scene, and they say to, to Jesus, you know, um, uh, our guy John thinks he's supposed to be preparing the way for somebody, and um, <clears throat> would it happen to be you? You know, and it's quite a witty scene. <laughs> and instead of Jesus, Matthew's Jesus just saying, yeah, sure, you can go back and tell John it's me. He says, look around and see. And he quotes from Isaiah, the blind get to see, the, the deaf get to hear, the lame get to walk, the poor have good news brought to them. Um, and what he's doing is quoting these passages from Isaiah that anticipate the establishment of God's good world, hmm. a world that's under God's rule, that's, that's, that's a world that is blessing for all people, that you know, it's an eschatologically anticipatory vision that he's offering. Um, and we know from a bunch of eschatological visions from the ancient world that, you know, this, this world in which God's reign is, is established in all its fullness, there's abundance of good food. You know, so we have visions of, of the big final feast. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a world of good health. It's a world where, you know, the lion and the lamb can lie down together. It's a world of peace where, where the nations don't fight each other anymore. Uh, and part of that is restored somatic wholeness, that there are good bodies. I think it's Tu Baruch that talks about, Tu Baruch is a text from late in the first century, a Jewish text, and it talks about the dew of health. Hmm. Um, as though in the morning when the dew descends, the dew affects good health amongst the folks. 
don't think there are any premiums on that except for getting out of bed. I mean, that sounds ideal. So I think that that Jesus' healings are anticipations of, and I'm using the Isaiah material, are anticipations of this eschatological completion, the signs of, uh, the, 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 the beginnings of this new age. And it's a new age where Rome's empire is destroyed. Hmm. There's no room for Rome's empire in this establishment of God's purposes. Um, so I think he's rolling back damage. And secondly, I think these are uh, uh, anticipatory signs Mm -hmm. that point towards this new age that, you know, someone has said that the worst thing that any tyrannical system can can cannot tolerate is when somebody says it does not have to be this way. The world does not have to be this way. Mm -hmm. And I think in the healings, that's essentially what what Jesus is doing. The world does not have to be this way. This is not God's intention Mm -hmm. for the world. And this is an anticipation of a different sort of world. Would would you say, I mean, uh, connected to that, and this might be so obvious to you, but just to kind of connect the dots in a way that would be really clear, I think, for people listening, like anytime Jesus announces that just the word Basileia, just the kingdom of God yes. is mm-hmm. coming, it is here, it, you know, all of that's political language. I mean, it's, yes, Absolutely. it's spiritual, religious, but we're all those categories were just all wrapped into one. Like that, that is, right. that would be a pretty dangerous thing to talk about the kingdom of God if you're not talking about the kingdom of Rome, and you know, uh, some kind of other kingdom that's going to take over. Is that is that right? Yeah. I mean. Absolutely, that's right. Um, and I think part of the big problem that we've had there is a translation problem. Um, the Greek word basileia, I think, ought to be translated as empire. And there is really good linguistic basis for, for that. Um, I don't like the translation of kingdom because, you know, kingdom is such an antiquated word for us, right? I yeah. mean, for me, it sort of zaps up castles and maidens in distress with their hair coming down to the ground and, you know, squealing for rescue and some knight charging by on a on a big white <laughs> stallion to come rescue the poor thing and there's smoke-breathing dragons. You know, that's what we think of as kingdoms, right? Um, it's a fairy tale, and I don't think the action of God in the world is a fairy tale. Mm. Um, so I would much rather translate it as empire. And I know that folks have, have argued over this translation. But I like the translation of empire for a couple of reasons. One is that, as you say, it, it forces us out of the spiritualized religious talk as though kingdom is is something that's only in my heart somewhere or or, or some other part of my anatomy. Um, but it's it's the empire of God. Um, and the divine purposes, according to the New Testament texts, are cosmic. You know, they're not just about my heart. They're actually a little bigger than that. And stunning as it is, it's not just about me. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a shattering fact. Um <laughs> So the empire of God is about the reign of God that that is going to that is in the process of being established and going to be completed, but also, which is all good news and on a cosmic um, structure, but also that alerts us to the dynamic that New Testament texts are not just counter empire texts; hmm. they're not just against the empire. But they also co-op the empire. They co-op this whole imperial paradigm and attribute it to God. So the things of Caesar get attributed to God as kind of the new emperor. Um, and the empire of God is going to be established. And I think that raises questions. I think that causes some hesitation. It certainly does for me. I understand that. Um, you know, when you marinate an empire, as New Testament writers did, as the early Jesus folks did, of course, you're going to think in terms of empire. And so you're going to replicate it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But our empire is bigger than your empire. And that's that's how it comes out. Um, and our New Testament texts find it very hard to imagine any other structure other than one empire replacing another. 
Um, sure, I'd much rather have God in charge of the empire than the Roman emperor any day um, and any president any day. Um, but empire still brings with it those connotations of domination and hierarchy and inequality. Um, and our New Testament writers and places replicate that, you know. If you don't get with the program, if you don't join our empire, then our emperor, God, is going to slay you, mm-hmm. um, which is at real loggerheads with other affirmations about how gracious and merciful and right. inclusive um, this this God is. Um, visions of God that I would much rather go with than the, yeah. the dominating, patriarchal, punitive sort of God who replicates Roman ways. So, the, so there is some... You're saying there's some structural continuity between God's empire and the Roman Empire, but it even that has some kind of internal tensions or subversion even within that. This this God who is father, patriarch, you know, does a lot of things that <laughs> acts in ways that are like very different than what we expect that that kind of figure to. Act. You know, before I, yeah, respond to that, but um, really quick, what what is what it, can you define empire? How is an empire different than just a government or a country? Like, is every country an empire, or what does it take to be an empire? Well, again, we're into disputed territory in terms of how we <laughs> actually do the do the definition. But for me, I think there are a couple of things. One is this fundamental uh, system of domination. Okay. I think domination is at the heart of it. Um, it's a it's a regime that wants to dominate its own people and dominate territory, dominate resources. Um, so I think that's that's central to it. Secondly, I think we're talking about widespread domination, um, especially that that has a center that extends to various other territories and peripheries. Uh, land is always very important. Um, the domination of people's minds. So we have, um, you know, a colonizing of minds is one of the famous phrases, um, a controlling of people's thinking and aspirations and loyalties, those sorts of things. Um, so I think a powerful center that exerts its dominating power basically as far as it can um, and, and um Get away with it, I guess, would be another way of well, saying that. So those would be a couple of dimensions I would want. So to clear, I mean, obviously, the Roman Empire is an empire that that's not in dispute. But would you also consider like modern day America an empire? I mean, it sounds like oh yeah. I mean, yeah, I, and yeah. I've even heard some, and this would all. Uh, I think it's only from political right wing commentators. They've positively spoken of America as an empire, like unashamedly, like we are an right. empire, and, and not yeah. in in. They would also say it's also a democracy or whatever, but um, uh, so I don't think that's uh, uh, like a necessarily seen as a negative accreditation to America today by some people. But um, right, no, you're right that especially from from right wing folks, America is an is an empire, which is a good thing because then America gets to spread American values and right. structures and and all those sorts of things across the world. Um, that, of course, um, is seen as a, as a good thing if you're one of the beneficiaries of those things. But if you're, if you're native peoples, then you're being dominated, you're being subjugated, you're being forced into a particular system. Your resources are going to be, um, yeah, I'll use the economic term, raped. Um, your, your land is going to be taken. Your people are going to be indoctrinated. Your, your local customs, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be impacted. Um, so um, I, I do see um, the U.S. as um, – as an empire or trying to be an empire. Um, and I don't think that's a good thing okay. Um, okay. for those sorts of reasons. And I think increasingly in our world, and I might be wrong on this, I've been wrong before, um, but I think lots of local local folks fight back. Lots of countries fight back. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, those in this country who think that the whole world is just waiting for and, and, and longing for American control, I think, delude themselves, actually. Hmm. Um, and I don't think it's quite as simple as that. And I say that as someone who comes from a colony, former colony of the British Empire. 
You know, the Brits thought they were expanding their power all around the world in a God-given mission to create, you know, all good things, and they did terrible damage, mm-hmm. terrible damage where where they went. And and I know in, in in New Zealand or Aotearoa, as I prefer, there was terrible damage done to to native folks and to settlers, and and there's been a long long legacy of that in mm-hmm. the country. And I don't think it was any different in the in the Roman Empire. Let's. I've, I've got know, all we do modern... have folks who fight back. I've got a lot of modern application questions I want to get to. Let's let's go back to the New <laughs> Testament. Um, perhaps you can – so there, there's one story that often comes up in this conversation, and people read this story very differently. Um, Jesus and taxation to Caesar. Render under God what's God's, yeah. render unto Caesar what's right. Caesar's. And there's just very different ways of reading that story. Can you give us a mm-hmm. reading like, – give us how you understand that pa- yeah. passage on Jesus and taxation? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think taxation, of course, is one of the ways in which empires exercise control. Um, they do it as a means of economic control because it's a way literally of removing production and resources from one part of the empire to the center. Um, and we have to remember that in the ancient world, much taxation, not all because we do have a coin in that, that story, but much taxation was levied in goods in production. So if you're a small farmer, then you literally load a certain percentage of your crop onto wagons that take your crop away. That's your food supply going down the road. Um, So taxation is a very visible, tangible sign of domination um, in an imperial structure. After, After the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, um, the Romans co-opted the temple tax and redefined it as a tax on Jewish folks that was to be paid annually by Jewish males um, into a fund that was set aside for the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus in in Rome, Hmm. a temple that happened to burn down and need rebuilding. Hmm. Happened to. Um, So, you know, I mean, that's a a salt in the wound um, insult to injury you know you're a destroyed captive defeated people and now you have to pay the same tax but it's been redirected repurposed and not to your destroyed temple but to the temple of the sponsoring deity of the victor of of the roman power to jupiter um, so taxes are, are really loaded, right? They are, they are not just something that you write a check for in February and think, well, I'm tossing my little bit into the big bucket. And if everybody tosses their bits into the bucket, then we have some roads or education or, or whatever. Uh, it doesn't work like that in the Roman Empire. This is a means of subjugation. It's a means of oppression. It's a means of asserting power and control. Um, so what I think is happening in that scene, you know, should we pay the tax or not? I think that's a real question. I don't think that's a set up question. I think it's a real question for Jewish folks, and I think it's a real question for um, for for Jesus folks as well, precisely because of those sorts of values. To pay the tax is to recognize the subjugation. It's to recognize the domination. So do we pay it or not? And I think the the outcome of all of that, and people make much about, you know, who has the coin and Jesus doesn't have it, but but the Pharisees do and, you know, naughty, naughty, et cetera, et cetera. I think the outcome of it is that, yes, you do pay the tax. And I think we have exactly the same thing in Matthew 17 with the, uh, the coin in the fish's mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, that strange little story. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, you are to pay the tax, but the paying of tax is is uh, redefined. It's given new um, new significance. So you don't pay it as somebody who is defeated and subjugated, mm-hmm. but you pay it as a recognition that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you render to Caesar what is Caesar, what is Caesar's, you pay the tax. But it's relativized Mm -hmm. because you render to God what is God's, which is a greater sovereignty, Mm -hmm. um, a sovereignty of the whole whole earth, 
which of course casts Rome's claims to exercise sovereignty over the earth as fake. Um, they're false, they're delusional, they're wrong. Um, it's not theirs to claim territory, uh, uh, dominion over the territory. But what can you do if you're a small peasant farmer or you're a small tradesman, craftsman in a town uh, in the empire? Um, how do you negotiate the situation? Well, you, you could revolt. You could try and take up arms. But one of the reasons that most peasant folks, artisan folks, never do that is that they know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of survival. But by recognizing that, um, that you give to God what belongs to God, any claim that Rome makes is, is relativized. It's not absolute, even if it wants to claim it. And that's the same thing in the coin in the fish's mouth. You know, that that God supplies the coin hmm. in the fish's mouth. Um, yep, you go pay the tax, Peter, but you pay it with a coin that God has supplied um, as a way of saying Roman power is not absolute here. Rome does not have the final word. Rome is not the ultimate power, even if it wants to think it is. So there is so a, a strategy um... in the meantime. There's kind of a submissive subversiveness in what's going on. It's not, no, we're not going to, you know, if there's there's some zealots looking on, they might want Jesus to say, screw this coin, whatever, you know. Right. And, and Jesus doesn't take that route, but it's not because he's pro-empire or even right. neutral empire. He's he is, he is reacting in a way that is still quietly, confidently subverting the empire, right. um, at least the empire's ideology, if, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so those things are coexisting, and I yeah. think that's really important. That's a really big recognition in imperial critical work or empire studies, okay. that people don't negotiate empire just in one way, hmm. that there are multiple strategies and, of, and often multiple simultaneous hmm. strategies. Um, there's a guy by the name of James Scott who's, who's written a really important book, I think, called Domination in the Arts of Resistance. Hmm. Um, and Scott argues that, you know, often people think about negotiating empire or power, you know, you either take up arms and fight it or you totally submit to it. And he says, no, 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 um, that studies of all sorts of historical contexts show that there's a huge middle ground hmm. between violence and submission. Um, where folks do, as you say, subversive things, but often covertly, um, often in ways that assert their own dignity mm -hmm. um, and assert their own identity when everything is everything of an imperial system is trying to tear that down. Mm -hmm. um, and I think his, his argument is so helpful for thinking about what New Testament texts are doing. They're asserting this identity. They're defining an identity of allegiance to God and to Jesus um, in the midst of a system that is demanding their loyalty in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if you appear to, to conform outwardly, you have an interior identity, you have some alternative practices um, that say, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm, I'm not defined by the empire. Uh, I'm not going to get my head chopped off either. I'm not stupid. Mm -hmm. But I, I have a different allegiance and a different loyalty in the midst. And it is quite subversive. Um, I would say the healing stories that we talked about earlier, yeah. I would say they were that kind, the the feeding miracles, I would say, that kind as well. Um, and the other biggie, I think, in the New Testament uh, is the holy eschatological expectation, um, this, this expectation that one day Jesus will return and Jesus will establish God's kingdom in all, or God's empire in all its fullness, hmm. um, that that Rome can claim to be the eternal empire as much as it likes, mm -hmm. but we know otherwise. Mm. Um, we have a different story. Uh, we have a different expectation. 
um, and Rome is deluded um, even though it doesn't know it. Hmm. So it's relativized in that way. Hello, friends. Today, I want to tell you about our recent guest, Doug Smith, and his newest book, Unintentional, How Screens Secretly Shape Your Desires and How You Can Break Free. Look, I'm all about thinking deeply and loving widely, but many of us can't actually think deeply because we're addicted to screens. And so that's why Doug Smith wrote Unintentional. It's a tech-focused discipleship book, and it is absolutely incredible. With biblical wisdom from Greg Boyd and Oz Guinness and others, uh, Doug helps you and your family overcome screen obsession. So check out the notes where you can find a link to purchase Doug's book, Unintentional. Oh, there's so many places we need to go. Let, why, why don't we jump to Romans 13 now? Because that, you know, yeah. um, the, this okay. text is often, and, and I think when I say Romans 13, people are familiar with it, but it's it's kind of the text that seems to be, I mean, some have taken it at the very least, a, a very neutral stance on the governing authorities, if not a positive view, like God has positively right. established uh, Rome and other governments and empires to um to do good in society to and he even says you know to re- reward those who do good to punish those who do bad the phrase servant of god is often taken as like yeah this is you know we should be pro in a sense government and people often <laughs> one's uh historical situatedness often determines whether they use that phrase or not <laughs> in america it's, it's right. usually dependent yeah. on who's enough well no i mean I, that's unfair i think people in America would say that regardless, they might just kind of grit, grit their teeth depending on who's in office. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, how do you understand Romans 13 and this command to submit to governing authorities? Yeah, um, I think this is a really difficult text for for anybody to get their heads around because I think there are a whole bunch of things happening here. Um, uh, if, you know, I'd want to back up a little bit just to, and just sort of make the point that, you know, people go to Romans 13 because... They think it explicitly says something about ruling power, as though this is one of the few places in the New Testament where that becomes obvious. And I would want to just go back to what I've just been saying. I, I think uh, engaging ruling power is something that the texts do all the way along. Um, and Romans 13 is just another part of that rather than an exception to it. Um, but I think you're right. Whenever I talk about this stuff in church groups or in classes, Somebody always goes to Romans 13 and says, hey, but we're supposed to obey the the governing powers and that's all there is to it. Well, I don't think it's that simple. Um, And I think there are some mixed messages in Romans 13. Um, Whatever folks might want to say about the beloved apostle Paul, he's not stupid. Um, That's one of the things we know. Paul is not silly. He's a bright person. He can see things. And so some folks have argued that when he talks about this stuff about being subject to the governing authorities who always reward good behavior, they're instituted and appointed by God and all the rest of it, that he's doing one of two things, either flattery about the empire or what I prefer to think, it's irony about the empire. That when he says these things about, you know, governing authorities are instituted and appointed by God and they're God's servants, all these sorts of things, I think he's sort of he's he's saying, you know, this is true for just rule, rule that is just and fair and life giving. But nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We know that's not what we've got um, Mm -hmm. here in this current setup. So some have suggested that it's kind of an idealistic, ironic beginning to that passage. And it's only then when we get to verses six and seven do we get anything concrete, which is about paying the taxes. Mm. Um, And again, yes, you pay the taxes because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, But paying the taxes is not a sign of um, compliance. It's not a sign of of loyalty to Rome. It's not a sign that, that Roman power is forever. And I say that because... We have to put Romans 13 into context um, of the letter. Um, You know, he starts off in Romans in chapter one by talking about how hostile and hostile toward God and how corrupt the Gentile world is and that it's subject to divine wrath. Well, the Gentile world happens to be, among other things, the world of the Roman Empire. Um, In chapter 12, which, you know, deep statement, comes right before chapter 13. 
he he declares that they're not to be conformed mm -hmm. to this world. And this world is the world of, of Rome's power. Rather, they're to, to discern the will of God. They're to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Um, so at the beginning of chapter 12, and some folks would see that's a major turning point in the letter, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, he begins by asserting loyalties and the, and the central loyalty for his readers and hearers in, in the, these churches in Rome and the center of the empire is that their loyalty is to God. They are not to be conformed to this world. At the end of chapter 12, he talks about God punishing evil and evildoers, which comes right before this passage in Romans 13. And right after this passage in Romans 13, in the last part of chapter 13, he, he offers up this eschatological perspective again, um, that the, the empire is going to be destroyed, um, that God's purposes are going to prevail. So all that material around uh, 13, 1 through 7 in, in chapters 12 and the second half of chapter 13, I think puts 13, 1 through 7 in perspective. And anyone who wants to claim this is sort of the absolute and final statement mm -hmm. that Paul offers that, yes, you must submit to the ruling powers without question. I think that's far too simplistic. And I think it misses yeah. the larger implications of what he's saying in the rest of that section it, is no absolute compliance. And um, it's um, so it's often taken as uh, when people describe Romans 13, it often sounds like almost like a God and country uh, text, meaning like, no, I, you know, I love God. I follow God. I, and over here, I also, you know, give my allegiance to my country and follow my country or whatever, because Romans 13, um, God's in control <laughs> and he established these authorities for good. And so I give my allegiance to the authority and it's kind of this God and country theme, but you're saying, but I hear you saying, please, I don't know, put words in your mouth, but like just the fact that Paul so emphasizes God's authority over Roman authority, Romans 13, like that is actually more of a co-opting subversive statement because any Roman person listening on to that would be terribly offended at um, the Christian God embodied in this, you know, Jew who committed treason was crucified. Um to say that that person is actually in authority over Rome would have been terribly offensive. I mean, it's not not a, well, a subversive, but in a, in a submissive way because he's again he's blending it with no, we're going to obey Rome, we're not going to violently revolt. Um, but we know why we have a higher reason why we're doing that. Yeah, um, one of the things that Scott talks about in his book. Um, domination and the Arts of Resistance is that dominated folks resort to ambiguity. Hmm. Um, and ambiguity becomes a survival strategy. Um, so, you know, you can you give to Caesar, but you give to God. And we all know who is, the, uh, we all Jesus followers know who is the higher power there, right? And I think there's a fair bit of that happening in Romans 13. Um, yeah, we've got these platitudes about government that get trotted out at the beginning, plus you pay your taxes. But it's all in the context of don't be conformed to this world. Hmm. Okay. And it is coming after this world to hold it to account. This is the end of Romans 13, to hold it to account and to destroy those who, who have not played the game, uh, the divine game. Um, so it's, it's, it's <laughs> I, I think of sandwiches for some reason. I mean, it's sandwiched between these these very strong assertions of um, supreme loyalty to God. Um, so, yeah, you can take parts of Romans 13 and say, yeah, see, see, we, we do what we're supposed to do. We, we pay our taxes. Mm -hmm. But it's not simple like that. It's relativized. It's subverted in a way mm -hmm. that's a little more tricky. Let, let's, since we're on chap 13, uh, 13th chapters, let's, let's go to uh, Revelation. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I had a little glitch here. Sorry, you were talking and I, I couldn't hear you. Um, uh, yeah, can we go over to Re Re Revelation 13? I mean, this is a book you've done, done work in. And, and this is often, you know, when people – and people describe it in various ways, you know, as, as a tension, a contradiction, uh, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, Romans 13 seems to ha be this kind of really positive portrait of uh, governing authorities where Revelation 13 pretty – 
I mean, I, see, explicitly might be too strong, but um, I don't know. It's it, from my reading, it seems to be explicitly saying that the government authorities are empowered by Satan. You have the dragon giving yeah. power to the beast, and if you read the context of the letter, we know that the beast is is Rome and and Rome like empires, and the devil is or the dragon is clearly Satan and it's demonic powers. So it seems to be very different portraits. Um, can you help us unpack what's going on there? No, I think you're absolutely right, and I think it points to the fact that we don't have one single way of engaging empire in the New Testament. We have a number of strategies by which um, the writings hold out um, for Jesus' followers to to live in this imperial world. Um, and so Revelation 13, I think, is, is one of the most drastic statements um, about the Roman Empire, and as you say, the claim of, Re- of Revelation 13, I think, is that the Roman Empire is in the hands of the devil. Hmm. Um, now, that claim is also made, actually, in both Matthew and Luke, um, in the temptation story okay. in both of those Gospels. Um, you, you'll remember the devil says to Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me, I will give to you all the empires of the world. Um, That is, the devil has all the empires of the world in the devil's control and will hand them over to to Jesus. Um, This is a common notion in the ancient world that ruling powers, powers in the heavens and the cosmos exert control over human affairs. Um, of course, we have it in the in the Hebrew Bible tradition of angelic powers. You know, Michael, for example, is the patron angel of Israel. Um, but we have it all through Roman stuff as well, that the gods sanction uh, Roman power. You know, Victoria or the goddess Nike, before she was a sports apparel company, um, the goddess Nike ensured victory for um for Roman uh, military forces. So this is not an uncommon idea, but here in Revelation 13, the devil is said to be uh, in control of the Roman Empire. And this is all part of what I think is 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 Revelation's basic argument, that in chapter 18, um, as, as Rome is judged and collapses, the call is to Jesus, folks, to come out from her. Mm -hmm. Come out, my people. Um, And of course, that that notion of coming out is consistent with the uh, metaphor of fornication that's been introduced in the seven letters in chapters two and three, um, that Rome is this great prostitute presented in chapter 17. um, And involvement with the empire is fornication Mm. um, because it is an idolatrous power and folks are to have Jesus folks that have nothing to do with the empire. Um, I think what's interesting in Revelation is that that argument is made in the seven letters in chapters two and three of the of the document. And by the time we get to the end of chapter three, where uh, John, whoever John is, keeps saying, "I have this against you." Um, and wants them to to retreat from involvement in the empire, the argument's been made by the end of chapter 3. So what happens after that from chapters 4 to 22? And I think what happens is that um, the writer sets out arguments, perspectives on the Roman Empire that show readers this is why you shouldn't be involved with the empire. So in chapters four and five, there's a vision of heavenly worship. This is the true worship. Um, You can't be involved with idols. It it must be true worship, like chapters four and five or chapters six, seven and eight. You know, the empire is imploding. It's already under judgment. It's already falling apart under its military, the four horsemen of the apocalypse in chapter six. Um, It's already falling apart with military violence and economic exploitation and all these sorts of things. Um, And in chapters 12, 13, and 14, you can't be involved with the empire because it's under the power of the devil. You you can't make that sort of alliance. Then in chapters 15 to 18, God is judging it and it is 
coming apart. Um, so this is, I think, the most kind of consistently um, devastating attack on the Roman Empire. Hmm. But two things. <clears throat> One, the, the document is full of passion, but there's no program. Hmm. The writer wants them to come out. But to what? To where? Where are they going to go? Where are they going to escape from empire? Even if they all go to Patmos, it's still part of the empire. Um, what are they supposed to do? Um, and if you're a if you're a poor poor trades worker or tradesman craftsman, um, how how are you going to live? Um, if you're a for, poor small farmer, how are you going to live? Because land is is controlled in the empire. So in the end, I think it's full of passion, but there's no program. And the second thing that I think is so clear in Revelation, as much as Revelation hates empire, and I think that's an appropriate verb, mm -hmm. as much as it, it just it disdains this Roman imperial system, it borrows it and ascribes it to God. Because in the last chapters of Revelation, we have these visions of the establishment of God's mm -hmm. empire. So as much as it's resisting empire, it's also imitating and co-opting uh, empire with its vision of, of God's world. I was going to ask, this is, <clears throat> I love the, the unified reading of that. So it's not just a passage here and there. It's not just Romans right. 12 and then 17 and 18. You know, this is, this is actually a thread woven throughout. Um, uh, yeah. When, when you said come out of her, that command in chapter, I think 18. Um, 18. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, I think you might have answered it. I was like, well, what, what was John expecting them to do? And you're yeah. saying he doesn't have any clear expectations. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I always think of like modern day applications because you could go the Amish route who have come out of empire pretty much um, mm -hmm. as much as they can. We'll try um, to. You know, um, I, you know, that would be maybe one approach. A another might be just maintaining that quiet, confident subversion, e even in things like economic justice uh how, where do you buy your food from your products um not doing our best to not participate in this really unjust economic system that we find ourselves just entangled in right where we're right. Um, is that how, how would you i mean we can maybe slide now to some modern applications starting here like what what would you in, in your opinion it doesn't need to be you know inspired um but um what would it look like for christians to read come come out of her and put that into some kind of practice today yeah well i think you're right i mean I, I don't think we know from revelation what the writer has in mind except for some sort of retreat mm -hmm. um but there is no program there mm -hmm. um except to somehow be taken up into the new empire um, but there's no pragmatism in the meantime um, and I think that's where we have to, um, as 21st century fo followers of Jesus, that's where we have to look. Um, and I think what, you, what you're starting to say there about um, understanding an economic system of capitalism that is so exploitative, um, that so benefits a few and so damages the rest, um, is, is one really good discussion that we have to have. Um, I don't think that's any different from a first century context. Um, whenever I talk about this stuff in church groups, you know, I get about three minutes into it and somebody inevitably blurts out, oh, that's just like our world. Um, and and it's true. I mean, so I think there are a whole bunch of things that we can take seriously um, as followers of Jesus, because one of the other strategies that we have in the Gospels is precisely this commitment to transformative actions and transformative justice. Um, so when Jesus begins his public ministry in Luke's Gospel, he reads from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and, and release to the captives and sight to the blind. I mean, these are all actions that roll back imperial damage. Um, Likewise, at the end of Matthew's gospel, where we have this eschatological vision, the son of man, the Daniel figure has returned to judge the nations. Um, and there's only one question on the test at the end. You know, 
um, how have you treated the vulnerable and the the um, disadvantaged among you? You know, when you saw somebody hungry, what did you do? When you saw somebody without clothing, what did you do? When you saw someone without housing, what did you do, right? Um, and so I think that there's a real kind of call for these sort of transformative actions uh, in the midst of this imperial damage that sets to to try to roll it back. Now, some people can affect systemic change, and that's terrific. But some of us can't. Mm -hmm. Some of us are left with the damage that empire does. Mm -hmm. And repairing damage, I think, is equally useful and important. Um, and I don't think there's any shortage of opportunity in our sad and broken world for those sorts of actions. So that's another way of negotiating this power um, to recognize the damage and then to set about doing what we can to meet those conditions, to, to repair that damage. And I think that's sort of a mixture of survival. It's a mixture of subversion. It's a mixture of, of hope and anticipation eschatologically. Um, and it's a refusal to, to take the current status quo as being the final and most desirable word. Uh, it isn't. Hmm. Um, and to work accordingly. Do you see, um, I mean, you hinted at it before, and, and this can be, uh, I us see how much time, I mean, this might be our last question, but, um, you know, comparing Rome with America, and here we're going to wander into, you know, a complicated territories. Um, I, I'm reminded of the, the, the is it the ape, apotheosis, ape, how do you say that? Apotheosis. Apotheosis, apotheosis of yes. George Washington in the, um, in the rotundra in the Capitol building where you have this, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I'm looking at that when I was there and then, you know, I've read about it since and it's like, wow. This, so this is not even quiet. Like this is replicating right. the Roman narrative 110%. Yes. Like, um, right. so that, that would be an example of like, no, no, Ro America very much prided itself on seeing itself as a new Roman empire. And yet others right. would say, you know, um, you know, you cited a statistic, 70 to 80 percent of people under the Roman Empire were living in grinding poverty or at least some level of poverty. Where today, there's certainly poverty, but it's not 80 to 70, 80 percent. Right. Um, we do have a democracy right. sort of. We, we can maybe talk about that. Um, capitalism and so on. Like there's there's some things that seem to be very clear parallels, other things that, that aren't so parallel. How would you. I guess respond to the question. I mean, this could be a whole nother hour discussion, but like, you know, is Rome, is America just like Rome, kind of like Rome, not really like Rome? And should we use these texts that talk about the Roman Empire and map them onto modern day America? Yeah, I, I think I, those options I would go of kind of like, mm -hmm. um, because we do have um, we do have significant differences, and there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, some folks have argued that contemporary uh, empires are actually not nation states, but are multinationals, huh. that multinationals are a more um, accurate and more um, consistent um, uh, alternative or no, not alternative, consistent similarity with some of what we see from Rome. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, but I don't want to say all multinationals are big, bad, and horrible either. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, they do. They also do very good things, just as as our government does very good things. Um, so I, I don't want to sort of just take it totally as one thing or the other and set up a binary that I think is unhelpful. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what all of this does is is alert us to some very important questions. Um, you know, how is power being used in our world? What sort of society is being created? And that's back to the question of societal vision. Um, you know, do we want a world that is dominated by a few, a small percentage of elites who pursue their agenda and the rest of us all come running? Um, or we pay pay for the, the price of it. We we are damaged by it. You know what sort of societal vision is at work? What sort of practices at are at work? What sort of structures are at work? Who are the personnel? Who's doing the stuff? 
Um, those, I think, are the really, really big questions where there is an enormous similarity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not just a matter of, of this or that building or, you know, um, how much territory somebody has or whatever, although those, of course, are, are in, the, in the mix somewhere. But I think the questions are more fundamental than that about the use of power. What sort of world do we want? You know, do we want a world where in this country 20 to 25 percent of kids are food insecure? Mm. That's a horrendous statistic in our society. I mean, that's an absolute abomination, surely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can't feed ourselves in our society. I think that's completely and utterly and totally unacceptable because um, there are certainly many of us who are overstuffed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm not doing that to shame folks. I'm, I'm simply saying that we've got this massive disconnect in our society, and that's just around food. Mm -hmm. Housing, that's another one, you know? Um, so these sorts of things. Um, what sort of world do we want? What sort of society do we want? How is our power and our wealth being used? Who's benefiting? Who's getting hurt? Um, I think those are the big questions that sort of run parallel and I think help us read both the scriptures and read our own world. Warren, that's a great word to end on. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And uh, I would really encourage people to check out uh, your, your mini books. Is there one or two you'd recommend if somebody's like, oh, I would like to dig in more uh, into this topic? You, you whet my appetite. Uh, is there What would be your kind of recommendation of a book you've written that would be a good kind of first first point of entry into the Warren Carter Library. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me mention two, um, both published by Abingdon Press, and you can find them easily on um, one of those big, big, big multinationals called Amazon. Um, one's called The Roman Empire and the New Testament, An Essential Guide. Um, Roman Empire and the New Testament, An Essential Guide. That's one. Um, and that sort of does a general discussion of these sorts of things that we've been talking about across the New Testament. Secondly, if you want to dig into Revelation, and I know a number of church groups have used this book, I've written a book called What Does Revelation Reveal? Huh. What Does Revelation Reveal? And it's set up with um, six or seven chapters or so, and there are there are study guide questions. And I know groups have have worked their way through it, you know, reading a chapter a week and all that sort of stuff. Um, so those would be two that would be most accessible. If you want to get into the heavier stuff, I've written a commentary called Matthew on the Margins. I've written a commentary on Mark, um, and and that would help with a sort of a, a passage by passage reading of those particular texts. Good. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Warren. Appreciate you and uh, many blessings on your work in ministry. Thanks, Preston. And likewise, pleasure to talk yeah. with you and to visit with you. Thanks much. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network. 